good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I, on behalf of the of Youth of Tip for, uh, I want to welcome everyone uh, to this uh, webinar. Uh, my name is Vish Vishwanath. I am one of the co-principal investigators uh, of this project. Uh, I'm a faculty member here at uh, the Dana Farber Cancer Institute and the Harvard uh, T. H. Chan School of Public Health. On behalf of myself and my co-principal investigators, uh, Drs. Gregory Abel Abel of DFCI, Dr. Jill Makowska of UMass Boston, and Dr. Adan Colon Carbona of UMass Boston, and the entire U54 team, uh, I want to welcome our uh, keynote speaker, our panelists, and you in the audience uh, to our first symposium on workforce uh, diversity. Uh, just a few words about the U54. Uh, it is funded by the Center to Reduce uh, Cancer Health Disparities of the National Cancer Institute. It is a part of their partnerships to advance cancer health equity program. Uh, it provides awards uh, for the development of partnerships between institutions serving underserved health disparity populations and underrepresented students and NCI designated cancer centers. Each partnership conducts cancer and cancer health disparities research, uh, develop and implement uh, cancer research experiences uh, for students and uh, early stage investigators and uh, for junior scientists uh, and effectively conducts outreach uh, to disseminate cancer advances uh, to the underserved communities. Uh, our partnership has been in existence for more than uh, 15 years. Uh, so coming to today's topic and the relevance of today's discussion, uh, to this audience, uh, I don't have to say uh, uh, or talk about the issue of health disparities or the disproportionate burden faced by certain groups uh, in our country, in fact, globally. That is not news to most of you. And there have been a variety of explanations offered uh, for these unequal health outcomes. Um, uh, and principal one of which is the issue of uh, structural and institutional racism, uh, which has been attracting a lot of attention lately, given the churning in our country and the convulsions we are facing and the reckoning we are facing in our country. A, a part of that is a lack of diversity in workforce, particularly institutions where we spend most of our time. Uh, and this lack of diversity in scientific workforce is also not a uh, uh, not something that is new to any of us who are a part of this. But this lack of diversity, whether it is you know class or race and ethnicity or place, whatever it is, whatever the fault line is, certainly affects the way we do science. It raises fundamental questions about. Uh, what kind of science are we doing? Uh, is this the right science? Uh, are we asking the right questions? A part of science is asking the right questions. And much of it depends upon who is asking the right questions. And last, what are we doing about it? And these are the kind of issues that, that we have to face, that we have to address if we were to think about addressing these uh, divisions in our society, particularly in the realms in which we all operate, the scientific workforce. So I'm delighted uh, to welcome everybody today um, uh, to, to be a part of this start of a conversation uh, in a, on this very critical issue. Uh, the way the program is structured is I will introduce our keynote speaker, followed by a question and answer session uh, that will be uh, moderated by my colleague, uh, Dr. Abel. And uh, if you have questions, please put them in the question and, uh, in the box on questions. We will pick them up and try to get them answered. Now, uh, that will be followed by four very distinguished panelists. Dr. McCaska will introduce them. Each of them have an outstanding track record of the work they have done to promote diversity. And the final question and answer sessions uh, will be moderated by uh, my colleague, Dr. Colon Carbona. So coming to the, uh, to the keynote speaker, 
Dr. Eliseo Perez Table. Uh, he is the director of the National Institutes of Health on mi Minority Health and Health Disparities at the National Institutes of Health. NIMHD seeks to advance the science of minority health and health disparities research uh, through research, training, uh, research capacity building, public education, and information dissemination. Uh, I have known LSEO for a long time. Uh, I know his outstanding track record. He has been uh, a practicing physician at the University of California, San Francisco before moving to NIMHD. Uh, he was a professor of medicine at UCSF and the chief of the division of general internal medicine for 17 years. His research interests include improving health of racial and ethnic minorities and underserved population groups, advancing patient-centered care, improving cross-cultural communication skills among clinicians, and promoting diversity in the biomedical research workforce. For more than 30 years, he has led research on Latino smoking cessation and tobacco control policy in the United States and Latin America and addressing clinical and prevention issues in cancer screening. And he has mentored over 70 minority investigators. He has an extensive track record of extramural funding, published more than 300 peer reviewed articles, and is globally known for his work. In fact, I met some of his and met and worked with some of his colleagues in, uh, in Latin America. And I also met his, I have seen him in action on his mentorship, you know, he's an outstanding mentor. No wonder he was elected to the National Academy of Medicine uh, for his very distinguished contributions. Contributions. So today, uh, Dr. Perez Table will speak on innovative approaches uh, to address persistent challenges on diversifying the medic biomedical workforce in academia, industry, and the government. Elisio, thank you so much for joining us. We are really grateful to you. I know you are a busy guy, so thank you. Thanks a lot. You, know, so you are on mute. Yes, thank you so much, Vish, and, and for everyone here. Uh, I'm looking forward, especially to the conversation, to see what kind of ideas we can generate to uh, make a difference. I think we, we're at an opportune time uh, in, in this country to really move the needle on many of these issues, and I look forward to uh, leaders like yourselves to, uh, to help us in that. Uh, I was asked to speak uh, not very long, uh, so uh, I am not going to cover a ton of stuff, but uh, hopefully enough to, uh, uh, let's see, I'm sharing my screen and now I need to get my PowerPoint in uh, slideshow. Can everybody see those? Yes. Oh, okay. And everyone can hear me. Okay. All right. Good. With these technologies, you know, even, even at my age, I'm able to manage it. So uh, as Vish said, um, I am at NIH. Uh, the uh, NIMHD is one of the smaller I institutes uh, compared to National Cancer Institute, the biggest. Um, we work very collaboratively, and I think uh, many of the issues that we've been working on for the last five and a half years as director are now coming to become a priority both for NIH and uh, the current uh, administration. So I'll start with just some basic operational definitions. We, we talk about health disparities. These are populations with health disparities. The first three bullets included on this slide were the ones in our legislation uh, in the year 2000. So all racial and ethnic minority groups as defined by the US Census, and that, as you know, could evolve. Uh, all poor people of any color uh, are also within our target uh, populations, underserved rural residents, um, and uh, in 2016, uh, we declared that sexual and gender minorities uh, were also a population with health disparities for NIH research purposes. Uh, so we define a disparity as a health outcome that is worse in these populations compared to a reference group uh, and not just any difference. But we also embrace the notion that all of these populations uh, have a social disadvantage that results in part from being subject to discrimination uh, or racism uh, and being underserved uh, in healthcare. So why does race matter? This is a, actually an ongoing debate right now amongst uh, medical schools and clinical care. This is one simple answer. Uh, it predicts uh, or is associated with outcomes that we all care about and we don't really understand why. If you asked a public health scientist 40 years ago, they say, oh, this is all social class. 
I think now most uh, if, if have agreed that the, there's something else going on here. Even Sir Michael Marmot, uh, whom I had the privilege to have a conversation about this before we went into uh, full telework. But you see that whites live, less, uh, live longer than blacks, and that's been true for a long time. And Latinos live longer than whites which people don't understand, so they don't usually talk about it. And, uh, and these are the data from 17. Social class is a potent predictor of outcomes. Uh, these are data from linked to the IRS, uh, but also uh, look to mortality uh, statistics. These are the kind of data that Raj Shetty used in his uh, paper in JAMA a few years ago. But if you're under $25,000 for a household of four, you're three times more likely to die from any outcome than if your household income is 115,000. Uh, and this is a powerful predictor. Median income in the US uh, is about $62,000 for a household of four on average. Uh, as you can see, there's not that many things that predict this level of outcome in, in, uh, in, in human health. Uh, tobacco smoking, uh, BMI, possibly uh, systolic blood pressure as well. NIMHD developed this uh, framework um, uh, in my first year there, the staff uh, did prompted by work I had done at National Institute on Aging uh, while on council there uh, to really capture sort of the complexity of the different levels of influence of research in our field so that biology is included as well as behavior. Uh, the physical built environment, of course, is also included as well as a social culture environment, which people are forgotten about uh, in some extent. And then, of course, the healthcare system, which really, really matters for people with chronic disease. Um, uh, which is a significant portion of the population. In our own portfolio analysis, when we look at what we fund, we're still predominantly in this individual column. So even at our institute, we haven't yet moved the needle on the other areas. Um, Vish mentioned racism. So it's appropriate that uh, in talking about diversity of the workforce, we, we start there. Uh, this is a Kaiser Family Foundation survey from uh, almost six years ago. We're asked in the past 30 days, emphasizing 30 days, uh, were you treated unfairly because of race or ethnic background in the variety of settings, including uh, interacting with the police or getting health care? And as you can see here, these are not subtle differences. African-Americans said 53%, sorry, 53% said uh, yes to this answer, past 30 days. Uh, Latinos, 36%. Uh, which is uh, in between what whites reported 15%. Although we do better in healthcare, uh, the, you know, it's a clear evidence to me that the problem of racism uh, discrimination has not been resolved. Now, everyone would agree with that now, especially over the past events of the past year or so. But um, you know, th these are data from 2015. Uh, and this is something that has been present with us for, for decades. Now, in thinking about racism as a research construct, and this all relates to diversity of the workforce, most of the work is in the interpersonal arena. Uh, there's with good measures, everyday discrimination scales, strong associations established with a variety of outcomes, mostly behavioral and substance use, but some on cardiovascular reactivity, um, and uh, and and less less so less data on others, but still emerging. Um, structural racism, though, has not been uh, operationalized very well as a research construct, and we're trying to promote that. We have a funding opportunity announcement out, widely endorsed by uh, NIH institutes and centers uh, to develop interventions as well as data <clears throat> on what can we do about this. Uh, and this is the history, culture, institutions, policies, the codified practices that really perpetuated this culture of uh, this ideology of inferiority in one group compared to another, this, this perpetuated inequity. This is built into our organizations. This is not an individual bad apple issue. This is not a behavior of a small group. This is actually in our organizations. And it starts with our institutions and our uh, NIH as well, uh, all of our institutions as well as society. And I think that there is a imperative now uh, to really evaluate, research this, and see how we can um, uh, begin to deconstruct this. There are other aspects here, but that's more for a research talk. Um, we wanted to talk about diversity, and I think this is a critical point. I learned this from um, your colleague, David Williams. Um, uh, a lot of times people talk about, well, we have diversity, and you know, everybody's different, and we're colorblind to, different, to, to uh, demographic things. You know, that's sort of following the 
the current legal environment that we that we face in the federal government at least um and uh, you know we're all snowflakes like every, everyone's different and these are these are generally uh, done uh, uh, thought of a way to um, uh, to generate some goodwill that we do care about this we feel your pain but they act completely ineffective and if anything they tend to perpetuate the status quo um, so in thinking about diversity the idea of a, what, what David called the what sociologists called critical diversity is really to include people from all backgrounds in your organization and pay special attention to those who are viewed differently because of exclusionary practices, uh, whether in the past or present, um, uh, with the majority group with power. So when you look at, um, uh, let's say at NIH, uh, the, the scientific directors of the intramural programs, these are the directors of intramural research at NIH, which is about uh, you know, roughly a, a $5 billion enterprise altogether, of course, not, not on that one. Um, 24 of the people at the table are white uh, and uh, two, two are permanent directors are women and two uh, acting directors are women. And the only non-white at the table is, uh, is uh, the Anna Annapolis, who is the scientific director of NIMHD, who's Mexican-American. So something's wrong with that picture. Uh, and, and I would challenge all of us, uh, all of our organizations to look at yourselves before we start saying, well, what's wrong with out there? because I think it starts with us. Uh, attention to parity at all levels and, and really confront these issues of equity, equality, education, and discrimination in the context of power differentials. Uh, and that's a, that's a critical part of all of this that we need to uh, not, not shy away from. Uh, it's, it can be painful, it feels threatening to some people, but we have to uh, begin that conversation. So. Um, that's on one hand. On the other hand, diversity in science really is a demographic mandate. If we have a clinical workforce, as I'll show you the data, uh, that takes care of our patients, and only uh, 11, 12% uh, look like 33% uh, of the population, we have a problem. Uh, and clearly, that problem hasn't been uh, not going to be resolved right away, but we have a problem. Uh, in the biomedical scientific workforce, uh, if there's data that would imply that uh, the scientists will actually do better biomedical research in all areas of science when you have diversity in the team. Um, uh, and this uh, actually comes in part from the business world uh, uh, where, where you see that uh, diverse teams are more innovative, uh, more reflective, more thoughtful uh, in, in, uh, in, in managing and resolving problems that are presented to them. So not just in the scientific sphere, but in multiple different areas of society. Uh, and unless we engage underrepresented populations uh, in, in clinical research, we, we leave discovery at the table and diverse investigators are better at doing this. Um, and then the, uh, the argument of, you know, what is the intellectual capital we're, we're leaving behind because uh, we aren't uh, promoting a diverse workforce. Uh, demographics are changing. America has changed already, uh, and we have to get on this uh, on this train. Uh, over 50% of children born in the United States today um, are not white, uh, and uh, children do tend to grow up. These are the data from AAMC on physician workforce. Um, they're not time trend, but I'll, I'll show you the medical school enrollment uh, distressing decrease in American Indians in, in medicine. Um, although you can see the numbers, these are N's, these are not percents of N. We're just seeing a, a decrease of over uh, 900 over the course of uh, five years, 2013 compared to 2018. Um, Asian Americans are overrepresented in health and in science. Um, that's a fact. And uh, so regardless of what uh, different, uh, this is a very heterogeneous group, what some Populations from some countries are underrepresented, but as a general group, as defined by the census, are overrepresented. And so generally, we're talking about African Americans, Latino, Hispanics, uh, and you can see that uh, medical school enrollment, add these up, it's about 15%. So that's some progress, um, uh, over 12% five, six years ago. Practicing physicians today is 11%, very slow, gradual increase. Although we have empiric evidence that says that having these physicians in practice makes a difference in healthcare. Here's two of the studies I used to talk about this. One was actually done in 1993 
um, based on, uh, on area practices in the Northern California, and then a survey of primary care physicians in that area. And they found that, as expected, that um, uh, high minority neighborhoods, high minority census tracts are less likely to have physician offices. Uh, but that the Latino patients and the Black patients went to see Black doctors and Latino doctors disproportionately. Um, and this was not something that the investigators uh, hypothesized. This was out of UCSF. I wasn't involved in that study. They also saw more Medicaid patients and more uninsured. So that seems like a good thing um, uh, besides uh, the, the race ethnic uh, preference. And then um, using the HRQ funded medical expenditure panel survey from 2010, similar results uh, using uh, the sample of 7,000 adults with uh, care. These are people engaged in care with primary clinician as a source of care. So already gotten through that first and two steps to have access. And minority physicians cared for over half of the minorities uh, and 70% of people who didn't speak English well and more, again, disproportionately more Medicaid and uninsured patients. Um, Lisa Cooper did very elegant studies 20 years ago showing that race concordant visits in clinical practice uh, done in the Hopkins area with African-Americans and whites um, uh, show that these race concordant visits were longer, had higher patient positive affect using uh, the model of patient centeredness and uh, physician participatory decision making style. And patients were more satisfied and rated their doctors higher. And you can ask any practicing clinician who's a minority, well, almost any, and they will verify this as tremendous face validity. Uh, in running uh, the general medicine unit at UCSF, I, 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 you, know, you, you put in a Vietnamese doctor who spoke Vietnamese, within a year or two, uh, half of his patients were Vietnamese. I had a Chinese American doctor who spoke uh, fluent Cantonese. He hardly spoke English during his time in practice. And even though I was the chief of the unit and would tend to attract some of the VIP referrals or professors and other departments, uh, half the time in my practice, I spoke Spanish um, with uh, either mostly monolingual or, or pre preferred Spanish. Another uh, bit of data from medical students, uh, this is a, an, a project done by a biomedical student uh, who's uh, American Indian, who's now at, at UCLA in, in, a, in a research job. She was interested in what students intent to practice was um, in uh, underserved areas. And this is a question from the AAMC graduate survey. So pulling three years worth and being able to characterize or categorize, sorry, um, uh, Southeast Asians and Filipino graduates as underrepresented uh, and then other Asians as uh, not underrepresented. Uh, we found that adjusting for gender, which we know women are more likely to, to practice in underserved areas and adjusting for intent to do primary care uh, specialty, which again, we know is associated with, uh, with uh, underserved practice. Uh, minorities were almost three times more likely to, to have that intent. And now the intent doesn't always predict behavior, but there is an association there that's pretty robust from the literature. And this is after adjusting for loan burden. And look at two, almost two thirds of, of these uh, students were graduating with, uh, with um, uh, over $200,000 in loan burden. Now, Kenny Gibbs at um, uh, in National Institute of General Medical Sciences published this paper uh, in eLife a few years ago, which has been used as very influential in thinking about. So uh, 20 years ago, the, the line when this got brought up in my role at UCSF on academic Senate committees, whatever it was, oh, we try, but the, we just can't find candidates. Oh, we try, but the pipeline is empty. There just aren't enough quality people out there. Well, that's not true anymore. There may not be a full pipeline, but this certainly isn't empty anymore. And, and in this calculation, uh, if you look at AAMC institutions, uh, if they pre-COVID, of course, hired 1,000 assistant professors per year, if they uh, did 10% underrepresented groups, uh, that's 100 faculty uh, that they would hire per year, uh, then they would retain these. You could, you could really narrow this gap, if not eliminate it, within a decade. Um, and, and yet here we are five years later, really not having moved the needle much. I don't have that slide from the New England Journal paper earlier this year that showed the, the rates of, uh, of faculty at uh, medical schools. Now, this is from uh, the national, uh, from NSF, um, data on US graduates in STEM. 
so PhD recipients by race. So notice uh, over here at the extreme right, so 2019, uh, similar to physicians, we have about 14% Black and Latino. Again, the American Indians, and they don't have a separate group for Pacific Islanders, which are often hard to uh, track in these data, um, are a very small number. But you can see, all, you know, let's say 14, 15% underrepresented minorities. So very similar to physicians. So we have made progress in the pipeline, yet only 3% of new hires are underrepresented minorities um, in, in Kenny's analysis. Uh, and I doubt that that has uh, changed to a large extent. So uh, this is true across the spectrum of science. Now, NIH's response, I think, is familiar to many of you. This was the BUILD program. It started in 2014. Um, uh, it was, uh, came out of the Ginter report. Uh, that was published in Science. Uh, it really started at the uh, college level, underrepresented colleges. And so you can see the list of awardees here, uh, including, let's say, San Francisco State. Uh, San Francisco State actually paired with UCSF, so they used that model, but not all of them did this. Morgan State's an HBCU uh, in, uh, in Baltimore. Uh, you can see University of Maryland, Baltimore County, where, where they have had the very successful Meyerhoff program. Um, Xavier Uni University of Louisiana, another HBCU, UT El Paso. El Paso is a city with about uh, two thirds of the population is Mexican American or Mexican. Um, it's, and you can see that uh, what has, this is a common fund program, uh, big investment of NIH. Uh, they're in their second phase. We'll see what the results of this will be and have really studied in a, in a critical way in a, in a research model, stereotype threat, critical race theory, student entrepreneurship, living and learning communities. Uh, and the UCSF group has uh, really piloted the stereotype threat as well as linking heavily on the resources from a high resource institution in is similar to the U54 um, uh, model that is funded by NCI. And then, sorry, the National Research Mentoring Network, I think has uh, been very successful, easy to use uh, website is now a, a contract uh, where, where mentees can find mentors. And uh, I signed up and uh, just to see what it was like, got a lot of requests and, and didn't really get engaged because as an IC director, I really didn't have time for that. And then I discovered that some of these trainees uh, and junior faculty really don't want uh, the mentoring that I remembered, but they want like a, like a consult, like a, like a speed mentoring wish, uh, if you wish, you know, like a one-time thing. And I, I do do that periodically with uh, trainees at NIH, as well as with um, uh, people in the, uh, from the US. Some general things from NIH, uh, we have uh, this uh, NMHD Health Disparities Research Institute. It's a week long, intensive, engaging experience. Uh, we started in 2016. It was actually built on a course that had existed for five years. So it was a pivot after I became director. Uh, modeled after some of the other NIH uh, summer programs, but really targeting early stage investigators and postdoc fellows. Um, uh, we do a mock grant review with real grants, which is uh, very popular and uh, a great learning experience. We have selected lectures. It's not meant to be a comprehensive course, but just selected lectures from uh, successful scientists. Many are minorities, but not all. Um, and they are meet, spend a lot of time networking and meeting with scientific uh, program staff from, from our institute and others. Uh, I also spend at least two, two and a half hours with them at the beginning and at the end, uh, first a lecture and then mostly a, 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 a back and forth uh, question and answer. So over five years, we had 270 participants. We will be evaluating this over the course of the next few years, a couple of Ks and at least one R1, one R1 have come out of this group. About 60% of the people who sign up are underrepresented minorities. And of course, we don't select for that. We don't advertise for it. We can't. Uh, and we get about 20% physicians. I'd say the loan repayment program, and we're in the middle of trying to formally, more formally evaluate. This is our preliminary data from our program. And MHD carried a disproportionate number of these over the beginning phase until last year. Um, so over this course of time, we have close to 2,000 awardees and not quite uh, 1868 unsuccessful applicants. Uh, and the awardees were more likely to get a grant from NIH. They're more likely to get an R01 uh, from NIH. Uh, so it's a cash assistance intervention. And if you're familiar with those public health community interventions, you know that cash assistance has 
good evidence behind it for economic uh, improvement uh, in, in communities and uh, for pulling people out of extreme poverty. Uh, and it is now available more widely at NIH. Uh, there are numerous programs at NIH. And one of the challenges is, you know, every institute has their own thing and we haven't coordinated as much as we probably should. Uh, some of them are listed here. The most recent one, Mosaic, I think is a very innovative one that GMS, law, uh, General Medical Sciences launched. We're signed up toward it. It's a K award, but with uh, funding a, a mentoring hub, wh which is away from your institution. And, and it, this included double AMC. So it, it fits with us, even though GMS, as you know, does all basic science. Um, the diversity supplements are a, a chronically underused me mechanism. And now I would challenge any successful principal investigator at our institute. Uh, okay, this is the third time you get an R1 from us. Where's your uh, diversity supplement for an you know your future replacement really for another scientist? Now I don't want to see a college student only or or only a graduate student. Those are great, but I want to see a fellow, a junior faculty on these diversity supplements, and that's what we're actually uh, we're restricting our funding in that. Uh, but there's also this issue of overfunded PIs. There are people who proudly boast, "Oh, I have six R ones." Uh, and, you know, I don't know, there are some brilliant people who can manage six grants, have great help, but it's really hard to keep focused on, on that many projects. Uh, and these are almost always entrenched white men. And this is part of the problem. I think this is part of the systemic barriers that exist that prevent uh, progress in this area for uh, individuals who are already in the system and are, are successful. Uh, to some extent. So the next step for NIH is this faculty institutional recruitment for sustainable transformation. This was the brainchild of Hannah Valentine before she uh, moved back to Stanford. Uh, we morphed it some, uh, tweaked it some. Um, it is being um, uh, housed at NCI uh, and Sonia Springfield, whom you all know, I'm sure, uh, is uh, been a, a tremendous uh, lead in this. Uh, NIMHD is housing the Evaluation Center. Um, the grants have been received, at least for, I think, for both now, uh, and we'll see what happens. It's a common fund program. Uh, there's a lot of uh, expectation to be successful, sort of the cohort hiring model. So what can I tell you that might work? So um, uh, based, again, on, on some ideas and, and some evidence. So this is from the, the much-cited and not-to-be-ignored um, uh, faculty tax, uh, minority tax, or cultural taxation, as some have served to it. So if you're the only one uh, and the committees need to have a representative, um, uh, then you get tapped for more committees. This is perhaps where women would have been in academic uh, health centers uh, 20, 30 years ago. Uh, there seems to be an expectation that you'll be responsible for all diversity efforts, uh, as if uh, white faculty were not able to do this or not uh, empowered to do this. Uh, I, I encountered that myself at UCSF. I, I, I first said, no, some, you know, the, someone else should do this. Uh, and uh, after thinking about it for a week, I said, well, if I don't do it, no one else will. Uh, and as the only associate professor, uh, Latino associate professor in the Department of Medicine at that time, uh, you know, you get a lot of requests for mentorship from students, residents, and other faculty. People are isolated. There's lack of community. This has been reported by faculty in the survey that uh, published in uh, Journal Journal Internal Medicine a number of years ago, uh, reporting experiences of discrimination. Many is microaggressions. There's discomfort with the culture. A lot of the URMs that make it to the faculty level come from humble backgrounds. They're not used to talking about golf uh, or going to the opera. Uh, and nothing wrong with golf or opera but they just have a different culture. They, they haven't been acculturated in that, in that norm uh, that we're used to. Now, college may have helped them, but may not have. They may have gone to community college, state school. They didn't go to, to uh, Dartmouth and Princeton or, or Stanford. Uh, and so there, there is this whole sense of uh, how relationships and culture get developed, and they report that in these surveys. Uh, no credit for service, which is a, a general academic issue. Uh, and in general, these faculty who were part of this sample uh, report lower scores on equity and in institutional efforts to improve diversity compared to their white counterparts. Uh, and that was uh, eight years ago. Maybe things have improved, uh, but we don't know. So what can we do? You know, and it starts with leadership. Uh, without leadership commitment, 
with resources, we really don't have anywhere to go. And uh, I feel confident now at NIH that we will make a, a, a full effort to make a difference because Francis Collins and Larry Tabak are fully behind us. And I think all of the Institute directors want to move in this direction as well. We need to promote organizational change and do metrics to evaluate the climate. Um, these surveys or uh, listening tours, listening to people uh, is important uh, because it's not something people are comfortable talking about. Um, it's uncomfortable for those in power. It's uncomfortable for white people feeling, oh, you're accusing me of something I had nothing to do with. And that's not really what this is about. Um, a lot of investment has been put into unconscious bias training. And, um, you know, including at NIH, you know, requiring this is, you know, okay. I mean, people will, will learn something, but it doesn't work alone. It, it, in fact, it, there's a good evidence from multiple sectors that uh, these, uh, these, divert, these, these unconscious bias trainings alone do not work. So it has to come with other activity uh, discussions and, and small groups. Uh, we need to track uh, how we're doing, uh, and we need to really incorporate and embrace the holistic review of admissions and hiring. And I would say even, you know, the issue of, of grant review, you know, how people think about grants, uh, you know, we, we focus so long on methods and then people thought, oh, innovation, but it's really impact uh, that, uh, that become the big, the big issues uh, that, that often get ignored. And then whether or not doing a, a, a cohort, I think there's some evidence to support that. That's why the first experiment, uh, it's not a randomized experiment, it's just to see how it works uh, has, been, uh, has been developed. And then create these mentoring networks. Uh, it, 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 listening to, to David Williams talk on this uh, recently, where he said that uh, he didn't apply for his first job because he thought he never would get it. But his mentor at University of Michigan sort of said, I called, I called somebody there, you, you'd be a perfect fit. Um, and that's the kind of networking that has been going on for decades uh, among uh, people in power that the minority or the underrepresented groups, women, uh, we, we need to not just uh, embrace, but act proactively promote it. Uh, and I think that over time will, uh, will help make a difference. So I'll finish here. I think I've said everything uh, on this slide. Um, uh, it really is not just about dem demographics and social justice, but it's also good science. Um, and, uh, and I think, and good health care in the terms of the, of the patients. So if I'll, I'll stop there and stop sharing and see, join the conversation. Thank you very much, Fish. For... Thank you, <clears throat> Dr. Perez Sable. Um, we're we're going to take a few questions before we move on to the panelists. Um, and the first question uh, talks about um, sort of other minority groups, uh, the, the um, attendee asks, I know you focus a lot on racial minorities in terms of sexual minorities. A big issue with bias discrimination seems to be religion. As a nursing student, we're dealing with a student who expresses explicit bias in relation to sexual minorities, and the university hasn't touched him because it claims religious freedom and First Amendment freedom of speech. How do we go about addressing these other groups or issues similar to this? So it's a great question. So I don't intend to say that uh, discrimination and racism exists exclusively from whites to African Americans or other minority groups, Latinos. Being the, those two are the largest groups. So they tend to dominate the conversation. And they're only ones that have sufficient numbers for us to measure to be able to track what's happened over time. Uh, since 18% uh, of America is Latino, Latina, and 13% uh, is African-American, it, it's sub substantive. Uh, as you know, Middle Eastern North African was proposed by the census as another minority group, which would have been a game changer in part for us, uh, but that was vetoed by the last administration. So maybe in 2030, we'll have another chance. And clearly uh, a, a Muslim woman who wears a hijab is, is clearly highlighting a, a difference that can precipitate or promote uh, discriminatory acts similar to what um, uh, Latinos, African Americans, have and American Indians and other groups have experienced. And the wave of attacks on uh, people who look uh, East Asians, uh, uh, particularly because of uh, 
societal issues uh, are distressing. Uh, these are very distressing issues. The, the, the question with sexual and gender minorities is important. Uh, we don't know enough to, to because it's not been something that uh, anyone has felt comfortable asking for people to disclose. It took a long time for people to say, oh, yeah, I, I'm comfortable talking about race, ethnicity and, and, and teaching people that this was OK. People, most people are fine telling you how they identify. Um, uh, gender and sexual, you know, that's been that's new territory. And but I think we just need we need more data. Um, and uh, before we can sort of, uh, but clearly there is a, you know, a transgender uh, person will probably be uh, a target of discrimination in, in some environments. We now have uh, a transgender woman who is uh, our assistant secretary of health. So, I mean, that's a real breakthrough and, and, and she is completely open uh, about it and terrific individual. So I think we're, we're slowly uh, breaking down these, uh, these stereotypes and these barriers. Uh, but uh, we, we just need more information on it. So. Thank you. Um, we're running a little late, so I'm going to just do one other question. Uh, one of the attendees asks, says, NIH requires universities and med centers to provide human subjects committees, animal care and use, RCR training, et cetera. What is, why does the NIH not require a minority faculty hiring plan? Um, and would that work? Uh, probably our office of general counsel would have something to say about that, but um, I, I think we're moving more in that direction. The the more recent uh, parallel or uh, developments around harassment uh, and sexual harassment, um, which five years ago, you know, NIH uh, sitting at a table with you know reports of something, and NIH would say, well, what can we do about it? You know, it's an institutional issue, um, and slowly we move towards. Uh, well, we, we have some levers we can pull, and especially when they come into the public sphere, uh, and this has become much more, um, much more part of what we're doing. And I think that the um, discrimination, racism, uh, concerns that are expressed to NIH by um, especially trainees, but uh, junior faculty working for a, a very powerful principal investigator or uh, a chair or whatever, uh, it will now begin to get attention. I think we're moving in that direction. I, I can't predict it, but I didn't mention the UNITE process that NIH has launched that's public. It, and one of the committees is focused on research, but another committee is focused on extramural workforce and another on intramural workforce. But the U committee, which is co-chaired by an MHD deputy, is actually focused on, on listening and on gathering information. Uh, there was a, an RFI, which I think they got a fair number of responses, uh, requests for information, and, and we are embarking on that uh, effort to listen to people both internally and staff, and this is at all levels, not just uh, scientists, uh, as well as uh, extramural. Um, but um, to get into, to, for the federal government to require something, it, 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 there's, there has to be a process, and, uh, and we have to make sure it's... Uh, it can pass in the in the court of law with discrimination and and uh, those kind of things. I think those, Vish has been in government; he knows a little bit about this. So. <laughs> well, thank you very much. We have a few other questions, which maybe we'll get to at the end once we're done with our panelist presentations. But I'm going to pass it over to Dr. Makaska. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. So, welcome to the second half of today's symposium. I am Jill McCoska, the director of the Center for Personalized Cancer Therapy and a UMass Boston PI of the U54 Award, which is sponsoring the symposium. Uh, we have four outstanding panelists today uh, who will provide their thoughts on the challenges and innovation in diversifying the scientific workforce. In order of presentation, they are uh, Lindsay Frazier, MD, professor of pediatrics in the Harvard Medical School and co-leader of the Dana-Farber Harvard Cancer Center Risk and Disparities Program. Kenneth Turner, the newly appointed president and CEO of the Massachusetts Life Sciences Center. Ken is vested in developing new ways to approach workforce diversity in the life sciences. And prior to joining Mass Life Sciences, uh, he served as director of diversity and inclusion uh, compliance uh, with Massport. Uh, Lena Gandhi, MD, PhD, is an associate professor of medicine in the Harvard Medical School and director of the Center for Cancer Therapeutic Innovation at the Dana-Farber. Uh, prior to that, she, she herself diversified the workforce at Eli Lilly, where she led immuno-oncology drug development and clinical trials. 
And Maggie Werner Washburn, PhD. She is the founder and partner in STEM Boomerang, a company that is highly involved in STEM workforce diversification. Um, each panelist will have eight minutes for their talk and I am timing you. Uh, we will have an overall Q&A after all the panelists have spoken. And so audience, please ask your questions in the Zoom Q&A and these will be read to the panelists afterwards. And we will start with Dr. Frazier. Thank you very much. And uh, um, I'm a pediatrician, so I will call you by your first name, Alicio. I just, I really, really uh, was looking forward to hearing your thoughts today. Um, and um, I'm looking forward to responding to some of the issues that you brought up. Um, my uh, entree into this work began with an interest in developing mentorship. And um, I found um, my way to uh, the University of Wisconsin and their Center for the um, Improvement in the Mentored Experience and Research um, and the, the curriculum that they had developed, which became the basis for the NR, NRMN that you mentioned. Um, and I, uh, I was trained um, there. And part of what really stimulated me to do this is that in our small department of pediatric oncology, in one year, we lost three out of four of the people of color in our division to other institutions. So it was clear we were not doing a good job. What was interesting was that um, uh, over time, this, uh, the, the understanding of the importance of mentorship has become a more and more important part of receiving funding as part of a T32 grant. And um, I co-lead a T32 at the School of Public Health. And I'm sure that part of the reason it was highly scored was because we had put in a very detailed mentorship plan based on the, the SIMR curriculum. Um, but what was also what's also interesting is that um, now over the last several years, I've been contacted by T32s across Harvard to consult and to train uh, uh, their staff um, in, this, in this mentorship. So I think in terms of structural changes um, that have occurred, I think that the the NIH is really looking for evidence of really informed mentorship as part of their training grants. Another aspect of the training grant that we wrote in was that we were going to try to recruit at least 25% underrepresented in minority students, um, which we have been able to do successfully. But it's been interesting to really recognize what we have to do to be able to accomplish that. So it requires conversations uh, with the applicants, you know, directly addressing their hesitancy about whether they're qualified to come to Harvard. Uh, we have to talk about Boston and its reputation as a racist city. And we've learned that we have to talk about cost of living. Uh, we almost lost one of our applicants because he couldn't afford to move here. Um, so I think at an institutional level, we really need to think about how to supplement um, the cost of daily living. That really, uh, that was part one of my entry into this world. Part two was a wake up call last summer uh, that was um, in part related to George Floyd. It was a presentation by our stupendous director of uh, 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 diversity here at Dana-Farber, Ildemaro Gonzalez, who showed us the data on who our faculty are. And uh, when I saw that it was only 4% people of color, which accounted for 22 faculty members at Data Farber, that was a, that was a real uh, wake up call to me that I needed to do more here. And at that time, um, one of the ideas for uh, addressing this was to create a faculty inclusion committee at Data Farber that was faculty led. Um, again, uh, idea of Joanne Wolf, our Director of Faculty Development and Dale DeMauro. And so a call went out to faculty and we have, I think 45 or 50 faculty from across the Institute involved now working on the issues of recruitment, retention and sponsorship and how to really address those issues. And I think what's really been interesting about that process is um, several things. One is how little we know <laughs> about uh, some of these very vital functions, like how faculty searches 
are conducted. Um, uh, we uh, are taking a hard look at issues like retention packages and who gets them and why and what's in them. And then really thinking about advancement in terms of uh, expanding the notion, the traditional notion of mentorship to sponsorship. Um, but I think my observation on these initiatives are the power of having faculty led initiatives where we're working from the bottom up to change the place that we live in. Um, and rather than compulsory education, and that was um, in, you know, at, in implicit bias, as you mentioned, um, being only somewhat if um, helpful. Um, and I think I learned something just last week listening to Frank Dobbin speak, who's a sociologist at Harvard, who's really, uh, I think, uh, a well, got a wealth of information that we should all be aware of, where he studied changes in the di diverse composition of faculty in 600 academic institutions across the United States. And what he has shown is that really that there's so much power in it that lies within the faculty itself and that the bottom up faculty approach is one of the most successful ways to really demonstrate a change in the, in the composition of the faculty over time. But it's also important to have a top-down approach. And I think, again, you know, just leading this faculty inclusion committee, um, what I hear from the faculty on that um, committee is that it's so important to hear from Lori Glimpshire, our president, and, and from Ilda Morrow, a, about their commitment to this work. And so I think there's really a need for a strong top-down approach too, because that's what really gives us work momentum and really uh, fuels the hope for change. So in closing, I just wanna make three other comments about things I think we need to look at. Um, one is compensation for this work. Um, you mentioned uh, you know, the, the minority tax. Um, it's something we really, really have to address in terms of uh, salary support, promotion support, um, and really uh, uh, supporting people to do this work um, and not count on just volunteers. And then I think at the level of um, the NCI, um, I, I do see this change in uh, the, uh, kind of the, the scope of what's expected in a T32. But I would love it, speaking as a, as a cancer physician, that that we relook at what are the metrics for cancer center funding. And even though um, there, there are small bullets that address sort of the, the um, uh, training of underrepresented populations, I think that could be, if it were elevated to a much more important criteria, I think would actually cause the kind of pain at a cancer center that would, could really change what we do here. And then there's also another section in the, the CCSS, CCSG review about community outreach and engagement. However, there's nothing in that about really proving that you can provide race concordant care or culturally competent care. And I really think that uh, inserting that as one of the criteria that a cancer center has to address could substantially change the the commitment of, an inst of the institutions to addressing these issues. Um, so thank you very much. And I'll, I'll pass the baton along to the next speaker. Thank you, very, very insightful and, uh, and, and well presented. Um, okay, we will move on now to uh, Kenneth Turner from Mass Life Sciences. Thanks, Jill, and uh, good afternoon, and, and good afternoon to uh, the federal, uh, my fellow uh, panelists and, and our keynoter. Um, as Jill said, I'm Ken Turner, and it's a pleasure to represent the Massachusetts Life Sciences Center uh, and to be uh, among you all today. Um, I have to first mention uh, how grateful I was to actually meet Jill uh, and Chancellor uh, Suarez Orozco just this week, a couple of days ago, during my visit to the uh, UMass campus uh, for a tour. And it was a wonderful opportunity for me to learn about the opportunities uh, being provided to the Boston campus's diverse student body. And for me, it was also a chance to reinforce uh, the importance of today's gathering on driving diversity in the scientific workforce here in the Commonwealth. I'm joining you all uh, today 
about five months uh, into my new role in, as the CEO of the center. I'm still learning my way through the people, the places, and the partnerships that make the Life Sciences Echo Center uh, here in Massachusetts so very special. Uh, but I jumped at the chance early on in my tenure to commit to be part of today's conversation. Uh, you don't need to tell me um, or to be a life sciences expert to know that we really do need to work much harder to crack the code on diversifying the life sciences and the life sciences workforce. Uh, my very early readout uh, on this sector here in the Commonwealth is that is one that is shared by many uh, in, that it, in, in that while we uh, have enjoyed a significant level of success um, in, in that Massachusetts ranks near the top uh, by any metric you could think of when we think about measuring success for an ecosystem, uh, we are the leaders in the United States, and I would even argue the leaders in the world when it comes to the life sciences. But what I find concerning, even at this early stage, is that I think that that leadership and that success uh, has been uh, what I would term as uneven. Uh, prior to joining the life sciences, as Jill mentioned earlier, uh, among my many different roles in life, um, I served as a director of uh, diversity and inclusion and compliance for the Port Authority here in Massachusetts. Um, I was privileged to, to lead a team that ultimately produced what, what became known as the Massport model. Uh, and that is uh, an innovative business diversity approach uh, that involved uh, actual um, uh, diversity at an, at, at an ownership space in commercial real estate. And we hadn't seen that, we hadn't seen a model like that or, or a commitment like that in over a half a century in the city of Boston. In fact, the work that we did in my tenure there is now being taught at both the Kennedy School and uh, the Harvard uh, 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 Business School. And I say that not out of boasting, but rather to say that that's the type of innovation that I'd like to see brought to the life sciences uh, during my tenure at the center when it comes to workforce and diversity. I wanna drive innovation. I wanna see real change. I wanna see minorities and women rates of participation uh, beyond uh, the science, uh, the PhDs, um, the, 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 the researchers to all levels of life sciences. It's one of the things that I've actually been talking to uh, companies about just this week as I'm starting to kind of rethink this. Uh, I was talking to one of the panelists just earlier about the number of jobs we have here in Massachusetts. Uh, we've got about 80,000 jobs uh, in the life sciences field broadly. Half of those could be categorized as R&D or the scientific jobs. But then clearly what that means is another 40,000 jobs are your regular white collar jobs. You know, the, the marketing job, the finance job, the corporate communications, the government affairs, uh, you know. And so what are we doing at our companies to diversify those jobs? And so I'm gonna start having that conversation with companies uh, direct, uh, 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 and, and unwavering, because I think that we are spending uh, an inordinate amount of our time talking about the R&D jobs and the lack of women and minority participation in the STEM sciences and engineering and et cetera, but we're not spending any time talking about the other 40,000 plus jobs that we should be thinking about. And I go back to my career in the private sector as an executive, and I can tell you, you don't see very many women and minorities in the boardrooms. You don't see many women and minorities in the senior ranks. Um, and you know, I was blessed and privileged to be one of those people. But by God, you know, we got to do better, and and we can do better. And I'm going to demand that we try to do better here in Massachusetts. Um, so I don't look, you know, at these issues uh, around diversity out of simple preference or solely because of my personal or professional background. I do so because. It is through that lens uh, that the challenges and opportunities in front of us, I think we can meet so clearly. And that's why I think conversations like today's that focus on D, E, and I are so important. Um, I would like to take a moment to talk about some of the initiatives that we have uh, at, these, at the center because I think they are exciting and I think they are meaningful and I think they make a difference. 
Uh, and so I'm going to share a couple of those with you uh, while I have the time and, and, uh, and the, uh, uh, the microphone. Uh, the Massachusetts Life Science Center has a number of tools that we deploy in order to continue to support uh, diversity and opportunities in workforce. Uh, first and foremost, we have a tax incentive program for companies of all sizes looking to expand their efforts by creating new and long-term jobs. Additionally, we have early stage initiatives, which include support for women-led enterprises. Uh, we have capital funding opportunities focused on areas of strength for our Commonwealth, ranging from women's health to data science. These and other efforts of the center have translated into nearly $800 million of investments committed into the life sciences ecosystem, generating $4.1 billion of leveraged investments in the Commonwealth and creating more than 14,000 jobs here in Massachusetts. And more to the focus on today's discussion. I'm proud to lead an organization that has been a global leader in supporting the growth of a diverse uh, talent pipeline through a robust workforce development strategy that has deployed more than $30 million to provide for 4,800 plus internships and apprentices and apprenticeships to colleges and high school students at more than 800 companies and research institutions. Additionally, uh, we've committed $18 million in STEM equipment and professional development funding in 200 plus high schools and middle schools throughout the Commonwealth. And I think it's worth noting for today's discussion that our high school internship program will now serve mainly underrepresented and low income students. This year, Applicants must be enrolled in or have recently graduated from a vocational technical high school, a public high school located in the Massachusetts Gateway cities, a public high school with a student population of at least 25% classified as quote unquote economically disadvantaged by the Massachusetts Department of Elementary and Secondary Education or enrolled in the METCO program. It is essential that our life sciences ecosystem values and embraces a diverse workforce. It is not only about equal representation. The bottom line for those of us in the life sciences is ensuring that the next big breakthrough to save lives and improve patient outcomes is from a diverse and innovative and creatively thinking workforce. The current pandemic, I think, more than makes this crystal clear to us. So. For us, this is about not yielding any ground in producing the strongest global leading life sciences sector. And we know the strongest life sciences sector is a diverse one. To that end, the Life Science Center has partnered with the United Negro College Fund on a new effort to set forth formally a program this summer to create internship opportunities in the Boston area for students enrolled in HBCUs of one of which I am a graduate, which is Southern University in Baton Rouge. So I'm really excited about that program. Um, and I can tell you that, you know, there are many other programs I can talk about that I'm not gonna go through, which will upset my staff because they gave me another two pages to read from, but I'm not going to read from them. Uh, I'm gonna just say this in closing, is that I don't think that there is a more relevant, more important topic than the one that we're having this afternoon. And in my tenure at the center, over the next few years, I can tell you I am going to focus like a laser beam on diversity and workforce development in the Commonwealth and the life sciences. So, you know, my commitment to you and to the citizens of the Commonwealth is that I'm going to live and breathe this every day. And anybody who wants to join hands with me and collaborate, my door is open and I'm all ears. And so I'll yield the floor and give it back over to Jill. And Jill, thank you so much for the opportunity to be here today. Thank you. Thank you very much. Lots of great initiatives there. That's really great to hear. And we will be partnering with you for sure. All right, I would now like to, uh, uh, to pass this along to uh, Dr. Lena Gandhi. Well, thank you. And thanks for the opportunity. I will say, I don't know that I have um, the ap academic uh, expertise or scholarship in this area. And perhaps my qualification being on this panel is really that I've worked in different environments and outside of academic medicine and maybe as an outsider have a little bit of perspective of the insular nature of academic medicine and how it's contributed um, maybe to um, a lack of diversity uh, in historically and uh, 
and, and maybe a, a view for how that can change from, from what's happening in other sectors um, and in industry, for example. Um, I, I think particularly at Harvard Medical School, there's, it, there's a very insular nature to the type of um, investigator that is nurtured and a very specific type of career that is nurtured and career path and one that has really a single metric for success, which is tied to NIH funding. I think part of uh, the diversification of workforce and academic biomedical research actually has to be tied to diversification of career paths and um, metrics and paths to success. Um, but, I, but I think of um, the importance of diversity in cancer care as being particularly unique because cancer, unlike some other areas in medicine, is such a disease of individuals. There's not only very unique individual biology, individual genetics, tumor genomics, individual immune system, individual exposures and comorbidities that lead to completely different disease in different individuals, but there is the factor of individual lives, individual cultural background, socioeconomic considerations, family structure, family supports and coping mechanisms that make cancer, that influence cancer outcomes and make cancer so, so much of a unique, um, uh, uniquely individual kind of disease. And the importance therefore of individuals in research and in cancer care uh, gets translated into how we care for individuals. So indivi yes, there's a, a lot of data around how individual researchers bring diverse ideas, innovation in, in their approach to research. But I think there's also the, the what has already been discussed by Dr. Perez Table that, individual clinicians and clinical researchers bring diverse experiences, which are often shared with different kinds of patients and patient populations, which influence the kinds of questions that are asked in research and um, how they're asked. Um, ultimately, I think particularly in cancer, you really want an individualized approach to solving individual cancer care problems. I think one thing, I'm a thoracic oncologist, so I think how much we have to get away from and have gotten away from looking at lung cancer as a cancer, as a disease of smokers, um, which is still very prevalent and I think really hampers lung cancer research. Um, but, I, but I think what's critical in this environment is that individuals are free to be individuals when there's a critical mass of diverse views. And I use this analogy of an actual organization or a loosely defined organization called Critical Mass, which um, I first encountered when I was a graduate student in Berkeley, but I'm, I'm sure Dr. Perez Stable is <laughs> maybe familiar with it. I think it started in San Francisco, but Critical Mass is basically a, it's not even an organization, but like, a, uh, I wouldn't even call it a movement. It's a situation that on the last Friday of every month, um, bicyclists, uh, throng into the streets uh, to all ride together and essentially disrupt and completely snarl traffic. Uh, California is a very car culture, so it's, a, it, it's quite a scene, particularly in downtown Berkeley, when you reach a critical mass of bicyclists and they suddenly have an impact um, that, that a lone bicyclist doesn't. You can easily go around a bicyclist, you can shout to curses at a lone bicyclist for being that bicycle in the way of uh, uh, cars moving forward. But when you have a critical mass of bicyclists, they are the vehicles on the road. They are the actual culture there. They're, they're, the, um, they're the impact and import for what should be happening on the road. Um, and it, I think it's very analogous to what we have to reach in medicine and what some groups have reached in medicine. So I think as, in, you know, as we think about examples of groups that have achieved critical mass, and therefore don't have to be locked into identities around um, how they perform in research, are women in medicine, and from my perspective, South Asians in medicine. Women are now 50% of medical students, and um, so equally representation to the population. South Asians are about, from different um, uh, criteria, between 6 and 8% of the physician workforce, which is an overrepresentation uh, by about four to five fold. But because of that, it, per it permits those individuals, and I will just include myself among those, to not be identified as a group, um, as a sole member, as a lone token um, within, within the, the research workforce. You can actually have your individual uh, views, your individual innovation, and be viewed as an individual and not as a member of a group or as a um, particular uh, place which actually has to be catered to in a certain way. When, when Lindsay talked about losing three out of four people of color, those individuals were uh, 
we're never reached a critical mass at Dana Farber Cancer Institute, where we, we were really uh, don't have a critical mass of any group. And I and I don't really think I don't mean to suggest this as that, that we need to achieve critical masses of different kinds of groups, but it's really achieving a critical mass of diversity to allow individuals to be individuals in biomedical research. Um, and I think, you know, what's different about the, the history of women, at least in medicine, which happened over 40 years without any kind of necessarily strategic initiatives, at least during the first 20 years of that change, um, is, is the ability to use strategic initiatives to make this happen a lot faster. And one thing I, I really appreciated actually being in, um, in the corporate sector for a time was actually how organized, um, formalized strategic initiatives can make such a difference. And um, that's very, very much a part of corporate culture, uh, it, not just about formalized diversity training or bias training, which Dr. Perez Dabley already kind of communicated. I think that alone is not enough, but it's really about formalized processes in hiring, formalized diversity uh, metrics in hiring, um, bringing to the forefront of the hiring process um, how you think about the pool of applicants. And it's not about really saying that, oh, there isn't a pipeline, or as Dr. perez said, it's really not that there isn't a pipeline, it's actually how you find that pool of applicants um, and how you identify and expand and diversify the pool of applicants. And that onus really has to be on the institution um, and the, the the people doing the hiring, right? I think that's something that that we did a lot. I, Lily, there were very very strong HR partnerships and re, uh, recruiting partnerships with the recruiters actually doing this hiring. We met weekly actually to think about well who and where are you looking for people and where are the scientists coming from. And I think particularly in institutions, it's also quite easy to do that actually. I think historically at Dana Farber, um, the investigators have come from a very small pool. Essentially, they essentially come from the residency programs of Mass General Hospital and Brigham and Women's. And that was for many, many years, the largest pool. And at some point, the only pool of applicants. And therefore you're not going to get a diversity of individuals. You're not going to improve research when you're starting from this very small pool. So expanding the pool, looking at where you're doing sourcing applicants, but also how you're sourcing applicants, what universities, what institutions, what geographic areas. Lindsay alluded to the fact that Boston has a high cost of living. So does New York. Um, having been at uh, a different academic institution in New York, I actually had a much easier time hiring faculty and research staff because there was a more diverse population. Uh, in Boston, we can be hiring from New York. It's not that far away, and, and they don't have the differential cost of living to the same degree as some other areas, but they're very easy ways to expand our pool of hiring, expand how we look at applications, and expand um, how we bring people in. And the, the same applies to strategies, a, a strategic and formalized way of actually expanding the pool of um, uh, expanding uh, retention and promotion. It's really about expanding the pool of applicants. At Lilly, at least, um, which was it is an Indiana-based company, so you can imagine that the, the workforce in general is not very diverse in Indianapolis. I worked in New York where the workforce was quite different, and but a lot of the promotions happened very centrally. And for us, we actually really strategized. Actually, I had a um, a, a person in my group, a scientist who was in clinical development, so she was not an MD, um, and she was Asian and not somebody who um, was who she was a very good collaborative, very um, uh, well uh, intelligent and insightful person, but she wasn't outspoken in the way that some um, some people who are more commonly white and male are. But it was really about strategizing how to position her in front of people who were making high, uh, promotion decisions, how to position her in front of the medical lead, even though she wasn't a physician herself. And I think there has to be real, real strategies uh, around that that are not necessarily coming from the top, from NIH, but are really happening at an institutional level in these committees that Lindsay talked about, so that we're really having individual decisions around how we bring in diverse individuals and keep them there. But um, I'll stop there. I don't. Great. You know. Thank you. I, the use of strategic initiatives in academia does lag far behind uh, in other sectors of the economy. Uh, thank you for bringing that up. And uh, we will now move on to Maggie Warner Washburn from uh, STEM Boomerang. Well, great. I, I realized I turned my background off because I, first of all, want to thank Adan and the partnership for inviting me. 
<clears throat> but when you have someone from New Mexico, you kind of go, well, why are you here? And uh, let me explain that uh, my mother is from Mexico. And uh, when I was at the University of Wisconsin with Randy Sheckman, we had just figured out that HSP 70s were chaperones. And so I had choices in terms of where I wanted to go uh, have my career. And I missed Spanish because at University of Wisconsin, which was a wonderful place, when they had Hispanic meetings, it would be me and all the janitors and they would say, why are you here? And we would have a good visit. And I go back all the time, so I love Wisconsin. But um, I wanted to say that what happened is, so I'm Professor Merida at the University of New Mexico and I was in biology, but I worked with a lot of engineers in genomics and, uh, and CS and math and all this other stuff. And, and uh, I also ran a big program uh, where we helped about 400 students. And I think I've mentored about 700 in addition to running, having people in my lab. So we will have had, I don't know, 175 PhDs and 50 MDs and a bunch of MD PhDs and masters and stuff like that. So that's on the side. I'm, I'm retired from that now more or less, except I talk to these people all the time. We had a mentoring program and it's it's very difficult for the people that you bring into NIH to talk about mentoring. They are the researchers and they call uh, me a practitioner. And it's uh, the, as Adan knows, our mentoring programs are have many, many elements. And so it's very difficult to narrow it down to, um, you know, uh, bias or, 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 you know, if efficacy or, you know, it's, I mean, what we're doing is teaching emotional intelligence and resilience and all these other things, but we do it in many different ways. So let me um, share my screen here. So what happened was that, uh, let's see, can you see this? Does that look can you see it? Yeah. So what happened was I was getting ready to retire and I had, tr I had helped all these people go off to uh, Harvard and Cornell and Princeton and Stanford and all these other places. And uh, I had gone to a business meeting and the businessmen were complaining that they didn't, we didn't have a high tech workforce. And I thought, oh, this is crazy because I know these people. I could, you know. So what I realized was that uh, there were so many silos. So the reason we're siloed in part is because we have a very shallow infrastructure in our state because we don't have a lot of people. Um, you guys, I can see, are, sal are, sh are siloed. And AMC, I mean, it's not just medical school. It's not just academia. It's a lot of places where we don't have um, diversity at, you know, at all the levels. So. Um, I realized that the domains weren't talking to each other, the domains of parents, the domains of business, the domains of the university, and the domains of the scientific uh, students and uh, STEM students and professionals. So uh, I, I thought, well, I better do this. Um, and so we started STEM Boomerang and I have, we have started off with, oh, workshops and career fairs and, and say three, 400 people would, would come and now we do all everything virtually. So we have more and we work with the space industry, all sorts of people. But the idea is to create a career connection with the, the applicants and the, and the companies. So we get to know the uh, hiring managers and what they need and what they're thinking about. But I also, because uh, Monica and I who work in this, um, let's see if I can get this to go down here. Uh, there. So these are some of the students that I had, and you so, can see how cute they are. And a lot of them are in Boston. Your slides. I hate to interrupt you. We're you can't see. No, we're not we are seeing, seeing the Zoom screen, but not the. You're seeing my Zoom screen. Oh no. Okay. Sorry. Sorry, everybody. Here we go. Here we go. Here we go. All right. So, so this is STEM Boomerang, and I'll tell you a little bit more. But these are the these are some of the students, and as I say, a lot of them have PhDs. As you can see, this uh, one in the middle, she just graduated this year and she was pretty excited. Um, <laughs> in any event, uh, what we do is is uh, get to know what the hiring managers want. We get to know the companies and because uh, the person who works with me and I both have PhDs, have a lot of research experience, m m decades of mentoring experience, um, we can really help on all sides. We can help the companies figure out how to bring in people and, and who's gonna fit with their company and also in terms of the applicants, uh, we help a lot in terms of resumes and uh, even career decisions. You know, what do you think of doing and how do you know your path forward? 
So the issue is that the, the school advisors, we work with a lot of people who have uh, been to fancy schools and uh, the advisors uh, have helped them except uh, not really down to the nitty gritty. And, and the longer you are in academia, the more difficult it is for you to know your skills and to just lay them out. And so it'll take hours sometimes to help, especially PhDs pull out some of the actual skills they have other than uh, you know Python and C++. Um, the reason we do this is because, uh, so I as have run this very successful training program and I've, I've worked with a lot of Native Americans, a lot of Hispanics, a lot of everybody. And I realized that I was sending them off and I was contributing to the brain drain in New Mexico. Now you may be surprised you also have brain drain in Boston. So maybe some of the things that we're doing can help you. But I felt really guilty that you know I was doing that. And then I also realized that the students I was in touch with, so I'm in, in touch with, I don't know, hundreds of students at any one time, um, that they were going through these things because you guys are also busy in, in your universities and, and they're going through this, why am I here? You know, all I know is faculty. My faculty don't know anything about business, on and on, all this stuff. So this why am I here really can create a, a difficult situation for um, minority students especially. So opening up to them all the horizons, really getting them to know what is in their heart and, uh, and, and then moving forward from there is, uh, is the answer. I can see my eight minutes is short when you're talking. So this is my this is a picture of uh, Monica and me, and uh, we have STEM Boomerang itself is an umbrella program. It's an LLC, and the idea is that the Boomerang New Mexico will get set up as a as an effective career connection device, which will be a welcoming thing. We want you back here. If you're here, you know you stay, but go see the rest of the world, but come back. We love you. Here's what we have here. It's wonderful. STEM Boomerang is the umbrella. And Boomerang New Mexico is the New Mexico specific component. And our, our idea is that there's a lot of brain drain states. In fact, when I spoke in Guam, uh, Guam, the Philippines and the Virgin Islands were all really interested in this concept. Um, the universities are not keeping uh, long-term relationships with their students. I mean, if you're only asking for money, I, all mine goes to spam. So anyway, that's what we're doing. And uh, you can go, if, if <laughs> there are participants here besides the panelists and I can't see them. Um, but anyway, so if you want to see what our applicants or what companies have to look at, go to boomerang New Mexico, boomerang-nm.com. And if you want to see what uh, overall what we're doing, go to stemboomerang.org. But the idea is to make a welcoming place, to make a warm handshake, and to really help our applicants, especially first generation, more traditional students who may wanna be closer to family, have a, a welcome home and a connection. The, the, the people that we're getting jobs for are incredibly happy. So I think that's eight minutes. You're gonna, do you want me to go on? Or you wanna cut off? It, it is I'm happy to share any of this. I mean, my mentoring program, I love, and I'm happy to share it. I'm, <laughs> I think we can have some discussion about it as well. Um, but yes, thank you. That was well presented. And I, I understand what the boomerang part is about. Um, uh, we do have this issue in Massachusetts, not so much for the state schools, but for the private schools, where um, only about 30% of um, students who attend the privates around here are actually from Massachusetts, and the rest go home afterwards. So we do have that issue here as well. OK, so thank you, panelists, for uh, your presentations. We do have some Q&A. And I'm going to turn this over to Adan Colon Carmona, who will uh, moderate the Q&A part of this. Thank you very much to all of our uh, panelists and speakers for uh, just wonderful, stimulating conversations. Uh, I, I'll start with this question, which I think is to all the panelists, including Elisel. Um, we need to change the institutional culture that we have created that incentivizes uh, institutions to want to partner with minority communities and institutions only to uh, advance their own interests, uh, so-called minority stamp. Uh, they'd like your opinion or to comment on this idea that institutions would go and partner with minority institutions or minority communities uh, to advance their own 
agenda. Do you have any thoughts about that? You can just raise your hand and unmute. Okay, I'll dive in so nobody else wants to take it. I can see now. So um, look, I, I think it's, I think it's pretty self-evident that when you look at the math of the demographics for this country, as we become browner, right? And everybody's seen the tide uh, of the math. In just a very short period of time, America is gonna be a minority majority country. We've seen it happen here in Boston um, in just the last demographic report that came out that shows now Boston is a minority majority city. We see it impact our politics as we see the next mayoral race come up. When I was talking with the chancellor just the other day at UMass, you know, he pointed out uh, just how diverse his student body was and contrasted that to the private schools, uh, which Jill referred to, where the, you know, the students primarily, you know, come in from around the world, they get a world-class education, and then they bounce and go back to wherever the heck they came from. So having said all that, I think, look, I, I think it's in the best interest of, 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 of our academic institutions to recognize that their customer, because I'm an old marketing guy, if I go back to my packaged goods and media days, uh, to recognize who your customers are. So your customers are going to be from these minority communities. And so you either recognize it early on and build those relationships such that when the time comes, you've established those ties that makes for a smooth transition. Are you gonna find yourself you know, eating somebody else's dust? Because I can guarantee you that there are institutions that get it and they are out there trying to understand how to transform their institutions into institutions that, that, that connect to the minority community and provide those access. So I'm not an academic um, of all of the things I've done across the military, the private sector, and now the public sector. I've intentionally stayed away from non for profits and, and colleges because uh, that's not my stick. But I'll tell you this. Now is the time to think about the future because those relationships are not going to happen overnight and they're not going to happen if you're not intentional. And so that's my, that's my advice. So can I say something really quick, two, two points. One of them is that um, Bill Gelbart from Flybase and now Norbert Perrimon is the head of Flybase and Susan Gelbart and all that. Um, he came to New Mexico and, and loved it. And so they would come every year and teach a fall class uh, for our students ha for half of the fall semester. And it was fantastic. And it brought in all sorts of people. My, our guys got jobs out of it, long-term jobs and things, but uh, it was it was very exciting. And so that's something that uh, can happen, and especially now that we're living in a virtual world. But I will say that when I started STEM Boomerang, it was because uh, I think the universities cannot do everything. And uh, so I really saw us as what Cisco did for computing. Uh, a, a group like STEM Boomerang can do for the for the economic uh, university infrastructure, and I think if we can relieve the, the the feeling that when you graduate you're jumping off a cliff, that we can help increase students in medical school, in graduate school, all over the place, right? Because you see that it's going. A few years ago, uh, a group uh, wrote that we were producing too many PhDs, and I just I couldn't believe it. It was so difficult. So I think the bottom line is de-siloing communication and creating um, sort of you know Cisco type connectors that can help uh, have the time and the and the bandwidth to really make the connections that you need to do a good job. I'll ask another question that's been submitted. Um, is there is there guidance on how to determine the number of percentage or percent of representation? Uh, to achieve critical mass in an organization for a given underrepresented community of people. I think that they're, they're referring to at what percentage is, is, is a good percentage? Well, the, you know, the, the simple answer to that is, you know, look at the population and see how close to the demographic you are. And since we're far from that, uh, that's the first metric to approach. You could just argue your population and your immediate 
surrounding area could also be another measure that people could look at. Uh, and I think following um, uh, Ken's uh, and, and Maggie's uh, comments, you know, I think institutions for the longest time didn't pay much attention to their community, um, the mm -hmm. community that provided their patients or provided the staff that worked in their organizations, not just, you know, the faculty who, and students who came from all over. And I think that there is now, I think, increasing awareness that the that, that, that thinking in terms of your of your population in a cancer center, we know that was a pivoted a change that occurred a number of years ago. Where, what what are the cancer centers doing for their pay to the patients in their population in your whatever it's called um, uh, catchment area, uh, and that really made everyone think. Oh, wait a minute, we got all these people of color here. We have what are we, we're not doing anything for them, right? So we started paying them attention to that, uh, or 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 different. So I I think that's the easiest metric to to go to. So, if I may, uh, since I have the mic, I'd like to ask a burning question because I think this is a something I've been very interested in. And Eliso, you brought up the the uh, assessment and evaluation of programming as you put on initiatives, and I think Lindsay also brought up this point of doing some self reflection and evaluating your practices. I'm wondering whether. Uh, either of you or, or the panelists would like to comment on the importance of being able to do periodic self-assessment of your work to ensure that you're really moving the needle. So I think of that in, in two things that are that are that have been done. Now, one is to track um, demographics, uh, like we said, you know, and whether it be by you know whatever metric we want to change uh, gender race ethnicity are the two most commonly used. sometimes people use others uh and, and not just in the um scientists the scientific workforce but also in all staff um if i look at the nih portfolio of you know representation um at the lower gs levels the less highly educated group African Americans are reasonably well represented. Uh, of course, we live, you know, we're in Maryland, which has a fair significant population of African Americans. But as you go up to the scientist level, um, you know, it drops well below 5%. Uh, and that includes intra and extramural. So uh, Latinos, as a contrast, are underrepresented across the entire board. So they're pretty much 3 4% in any category. Um, in, in in NIH, these are NIH employees, staff only, not not uh, anywhere else. So that's one. And the other is more expensive, which is to periodically take the pulse of the community. Um, people call it a climate survey or some sort of way of knowing what attitudes and behaviors are out there. We, we NIH did that for the harassment uh, issue, you know. If we're going to tell grantees, oh, you, you know, people, you know, sexual harassment is a big deal. We have to start our own, our own house and, and see. And, and, and frankly, the respondents, even though it was very directed at sexual harassment, responded generally about other kinds of harassment as well, you know, bullying and incivility at work, and, as well as discrimination and microaggression. So I think that's a way, a way to do it. Those two uh, are, are ways, uh, ways to do it, to see, you know, will people feel comfortable going there? And, um, and there is this, uh, uh, you know, you, you got to start somewhere, right? But as you get, you know, one or two or three to stay, then you start getting momentum about people saying, that's a good place, we want to go there. And, and, uh, and, and this is where, where, where you can make a difference, I think, move the needle. Does anybody else want to comment? Um, Adan, mm -hmm. um, I think there's a lot of interest at Dana-Farber to develop a, a consistent dashboard that's, you know, very transparent about what our metrics are that would be visible to all the staff on a, on a, on a, on a rolling basis um, so that we, we all are aware of where we stand. Um, but there's also some, there's also some, uh, uh, programs that have been developed that I don't think we're taking advantage of here. So um, actually, um, Goyo Abel is actually leading the work with Michael Chang on, on faculty searches 
And one of the things that we've received is the, you know, advice from the provost of Harvard on, you know, sort of optimal ways to do faculty service searches. I didn't realize that Harvard has a very elaborate program already that they call the ARIES program, where they start at the very beginning of the search process, to understand, you know, how they're advertising it, who, who's applying, what the, what the metrics of the applicants are. Um, and I don't think we have that in place for our faculty searches here at Dana-Farber, but there's, there, there, are, there are things that we can do um, to that where we, we don't have to start from the very beginning, um, where we can develop some of these tools that have already been created that really are gonna help us get the data on what's happening and understand where the, where the real chinks in the system are um, mm -hmm. to make progress. Vish, did you want to ask a question? Yeah. So um, I want to um, start with an analogy. Um, so many years ago, the laws against drunk driving in our country were lax. Um, so you now people were able to get away scot free or with just a slap on the wrist, uh, you know, for drunk driving violations. So one organization, Mothers Against Drunk Driving, um, decided to take a different approach. They went to the legislators, begged them to make the laws more stringent, more strict, nothing happened. Uh, there was always this lobby which was working against them. So they started a program where they started ranking the states on the strength of their drunk driving laws. And then they would hold a press conference uh, to announce how the states ranked on the strength of these laws. Every legislature and the legislator hated it, hated it, because they never wanted to be drawn attention to the fact that they have lax laws. It is like the US News and World Report ranking, right? Every institution hates it unless they are number one. So what happened over a period of time, despite their over uh, attitude against the uh, ranking by MAD, states started strengthening their laws against drunk driving. And, and within a very short time, within a few years, you know, you could see the impact of, you know, where people were, uh, who violated this law sort of very strict, but were strictly punished. The reason I'm bringing this analogy is I think there have been an excellent outstanding suggestions here. Some of them very creative, some of them we know, uh, and my question is, is there a way we can, we can uh, use all the ideas and more ideas, the better, but at the end of the day, there has to be some accountability. So what if we say as, as a way to grade the leadership, you know, uh, of organizations, you know, as a part of changing the culture, you know, their strength in improving diversity in their workforce particularly the STEM leadership, the presidents, the CEOs um, explicitly saying, okay, this is, you know, we talk about, you know, the stock going up with certain level, you know, we talk about profits, we talk about efficiency and productivity. Why not say, okay, here is a, uh, particularly in our work, not just academy, but kind of a, um, organizations employing scientific workforce saying, okay, here is a way over the next, five years or 10 years as you remain the CEO, you know, uh, and executive leadership, this is how we will be graded. Uh, I'm just being provocative for argument's sake. Uh, there are some variations of this around, including reporting on diversity, but I wonder if we don't have teeth uh, to this, does it work? It's just a start of the conversation. So. The, the answer is no, it does not work. Uh, I can tell you as someone who spent 25 years in the private sector, who became, uh, in effect, a you know senior executive in in media and in packaged goods, I I am of the firm belief that you get what you measure, and that's exactly what you're talking about, Vish. You get what you measure, and what do I mean by that? My performance, which then informed my bonus, which was my money, was tied to certain metrics, and I would argue that unless you tie diversity objectively to 
that bonus structure, that compensation structure, you're never going to move the needle. Because as human beings, and I'm not saying that these guys are bad guys. So let me be clear. I'm not claiming that they mm -hmm. are a bunch of, you know, pinhead, you know, Ku Klux Klan men running around at Time Warner or wherever, because that wasn't the case. <laughs> but again, I think it goes back to you get what you measure. So if you tell me I have eight things that are going to drive my bonus, then guess what? Every day I'm focused on those eight things because I want my money. At the end of the year, I want my money. And those eight things are going to ensure that I get paid. And so now that other two or three things you put on there, squishy things like, oh, yeah, and by the way, create a diverse culture. And blah, blah. I'm like, yeah, well, that's great. I'll get to that when I get to that. So until companies and organizations step up, and let's go refer to it earlier. You know, the question came up about, you know, can you put metrics around hiring? The answer is, yes, you can. We, 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 we stray away from it because we don't want to do it. But I would argue that, yes, you can. You can look at an organization and say, you know what, right now I'm at 2% and in a year or a year and a half, I want to see that number at 5%. And I'll bet you if you tie my bonus to that, guess what? It's going to be 5%. Yeah, so that's what I'm asking. So can we can do that then? You say it will work. Absolutely. I'm, I'm totally convinced it can work. So this is an incentivization program. And uh, it would be interesting to see if, if any current academic institutions or, or indus, industrial organizations have something in place like that to promote diversity and inclusion. I, I don't know if they do or not, but um, that, might be, uh, that might be the only way to actually uh, make the practice widespread uh, is if there's a, a kind of a reward at the end of it. So in, in the context of cancer about... centers, sorry, that could be the that could be part linked to CCSG renewal, right? Cancer center support grant renewal. Um, I, I mean, that is part of it, but maybe it's one of those squishy factors right now, and maybe it needs to be a more hard wide, wired factor. I totally agree. I, was... I think it really has to be built into that section on community engagement, is that we have to have the faculty and staff that can engage our communities, and that has to be explicit. And I also think that the, the recommendations around training of underrepresented um, uh, in medicine faculty also has to be much more, uh, much more concrete, because you know that the Cancer Center will respond when it, it gets on the list, right? We'll make it happen. Maggie, so, did you want to say something? Yeah, I think you're talking about a lot of different levels here of things. I mean, you're talking about hiring. Yes, you can do that. You're talking about incentives and reward structure. It little bothers me to feel like people would get money for hiring me, but you know, I guess you can do that. That's all right, except that I'm a human being and I would like to be loved by the faculty. So let me ask you a question. Do most of you, and you can raise your hand, do most of you feel that your greatest limiting factor in your career is time? What do you think is the greatest? Yeah, 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 that's right. That's right. So if I had a, a lot of time, I can, I can do the thing that we did with our students, actually, the more cultures we had together, the better. And we would have these discussions about know your heart, look for the positive or the blessing and everything. Oh, I lost my computer, but at least I had it backed up, that kind of stuff to teach resilience and embrace who you are and bring it to the table. And that had two factors. One was that in all of our DNA is all our ancestors. And then we also have our personal story. But talking about this across cultures, ultimately we realized there was this enormous thing that we all shared in common that we really love to hear about that was uh you know in, we never heard well my culture doesn't do this and then after that we would go well my my we have a clan system oh everybody in my village has the same last name and, and then we would start talking about all this stuff so ultimately i think you have to kind of decide on levels that you want to talk about but but ultimately in retention uh, you have to create a community and it's possible to do it but if time's a limiting factor i think you have to think carefully about how to do that uh, this all is, i just want to share that i think in the academic setting I, I agree completely with ken that you know the the incentivizing with economic incentives works we know that from multiple multiple different uh, areas and in a, and in a in a academic setting it, it can often be a collective incentive where you create you have a you have leadership create resources for programs 
uh, that otherwise wouldn't exist and, and then build them into the culture so that they are sustainable with units uh, resources. Uh, and also with recruitment of diversity into into institutions, the I learned this from David Williams that the the, the Michigan mandate uh, from the late '80s and, and '90s that the president of the institution said we need to be more diverse. So he reserved, uh, I think it was two percent of their uh, operating budget uh, for a diverse program pro programs that would promote diversity, and you had to submit a a request, an application of how we're going to do this. So it's incentives, uh, but it isn't a uh, bonus, in, you know, money in your wallet as much as is, you know, here's money to do something that otherwise you wouldn't have time to do or you wouldn't have the resources to do. And it worked. They doubled their uh, admission rates, uh, their uh, student body uh, diversity over the course of about a decade. Um, and I think that those kinds of, uh, of examples, you know, uh, now, you know, we have to pass the, uh, the legal constraints that exist, but uh, the, the, we, we, have it, we have evidence that these things work. You know, there's, there's evidence in the disparities world, you know, uh, the socialization experiment that people call integration of the 60s and 70s, which was, you know, had, had its issues, there were limitations, and there was a lot of pushback towards the end, actually worked it, it african-american mortality and morbidity decreased during those 20 years in a way that it hasn't ha hasn't happened since uh and and looking back you know the pain involved you know no change ever happens without pain we know that so uh you know it was the busing issue that got the political will ended uh because of that but it sort of sustained the 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 foundation of uh, of this problem which is residential segregation or one of the major foundations. Of this. So I, I think that these are the kinds of things that we now have, I think, an opportunity to begin to do something about that, not just talk about it, but begin to act on them. Uh, because the window, there is a window of opportunity that we never know when it's going to close again. So I also think it's important to um, make sure that we include the voice of the scholars of color in this process. Absolutely. Um, you know, yeah. certainly talking about incentives and other things, certain incentives would feel better for scholars of color being in a community and others would feel not as good. And, um, you know, that I, we do have to balance it out with the burden on our scholars of color to run all this and be on every committee. But that doesn't mean that we we can do things that have both face validity and actually will affect a change without sincere input um, from what it's like to be in communities that are trying to make these changes. So. Let's go back to the uh, participants or the uh, people who are attending the webinar. And then there's a comment here around uh, something that Kenneth brought up when during his presentation about how corporations do train and mentor this middle management and supervisors. And I think uh, what they're trying to ask is, um, how can we formalize NIH or, or uh, organizations like the Mass Life Sciences Center to promote programs that get at diversifying the workforce at these other levels, other than just the researchers and the scientists, but this, the middle managers, the supervisors, uh, uh, or these other sectors that are, are not just, you know, in the laboratory. Is there a place for that in this conversation where, you know, we're, we're training these other Right. And, and I would argue that there is. Uh, so, you know, I, I don't claim to have a formula today uh, or to have all the answers today. But I can tell you this, that, you know, you know, back to the, the analogy I was making earlier, the, the point I was making earlier around the 50 percent of the workforce that is, you know, non-scientist, right, non-PhDs, et cetera. You know, again, I just go back to my, you know, I go back to literally my experience as a general manager and as an executive in, in, in corporate America. I, I just, I, I, I remember it well when I was at Hasbro, Hallmark Cards, AOL, Time Warner, all these companies I worked at, that, you know, as a black executive, I made it a point when I looked at my staff to say, when a job came open, I was gonna make sure that the pool right? The actual pool of people that were sent to me to be interviewed or sent to my managers to be interviewed, I insisted that it be a diverse pool. So that's where you've got to start. If you don't start there, you never, you know, 
garbage in, garbage out, as we say in the Navy, in the submarine force, right? If you, if you, if you don't start with a balanced pull, you're never going to get what you want on the other side. The other part of it, though, is, yes, once you start to get people to come into the company, you got to recognize that you're going to have to mentor them, sponsor them, and support them. Because coming in as the first one, and oftentimes, frankly, I was the only one. I kid you not. I was the only one in my submarine class out of 88 officers. I was the only one in my nuclear missile class out of 17. I was the only one on my submarine that was an, that, 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 that was an officer out of 150 men. And I could go on and on. And that's just the military. That doesn't count the corporate side. And so you feel isolated. You feel alone and you feel unrecognized. And so you've got to, you've got to recognize that it's going to take a while to build critical mass. And once you still have to build a critical mass, then it becomes organic. You don't have to, you don't have to focus on it so much. You know, it'll just kind of take on and take on a life of its own. But my point of this is that it's 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 an involved process. You're not going to just, you know, it can't be just simply, oh, I'm at, you know, 2% today, so I want to be at 3% tomorrow. If that's the way you view it. It's never going to work. It's never going to work. Yes, it's about the numbers, but it's about all of the other parts of diversity. It, it's a cliche, but we've all heard it about. Diversity is being invited to the dance. Inclusion is being asked to dance, right? So, you know, it kind of gets at it, but that's the point. You got to recognize that getting them there is the first step. That's not the end. That's the beginning of the process. Then you have to make them feel like they belong and that they're part of the team. And the way to do that takes a whole lot of a whole lot of effort, but it's effort that's worthwhile. And once you start it, it does take on a life of its own. And then you can let it go and just let it happen organically. But that take, but all of this takes vision, boldness, and leadership. You lack those things, you're never going to get there. So one final thought, and then I'll shut the hell up. And that is it starts at the top. I, I can't emphasize this enough. It starts at the top. The president, the CEO, the executive director, whatever that title is, if that person, if that person, her or him, doesn't believe in this passionately, it's not going to happen. This is not something that bubbles up from the bottom. It's not revolutionary. It has to start at the top. They have to have this as a leadership value and drive it through the organization or it'll never happen. Maybe one last question, and then we're reaching almost time. Um, what kind of systematic approaches could the government or institutions take uh, in order to promote community engagement without seeking to obtain that minority stamp? I think it starts by uh, going to the community, actually, and talking to people. Um, you know, I, 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 I remember as an assistant professor at UCSF, you know, we, we, we got a grant from NCI on smoking cessation in Latinos. Um, and, uh, and we, we kind of pivoted to more of a community-based intervention from, as opposed from uh, controlled studies with the groups. And well, even before that, we, we were going to connect to the community. We needed to be in the community health center. Went, I went, we went, met with the radio station people, with organizations, and they were fascinated that someone from the university was interested in them um, because they just did their thing and they, the university was up on the hill. They didn't, they didn't think they, so that's the start there. And then you build these relationships. Um, you, you know, you go to the, you go to the events on, at the church uh, on Sundays, or you, you go to the, the activities that they have to celebrate. Uh, you build a relationship that has to be uh, sustainable and mutual. Uh, you want to do research with them. You want to collaborate on it, you know, and they'll, and, and, but if they need something from you, uh, you have to be willing to, to provide it. And what I found is that you don't always have to have a grant. You don't always have to have uh, a program, um, the tangible program, but you, you can't disappear. Uh, you have to be there and you have to be, uh, uh, you know, it's a mutual exchange. Um, institutions uh, can do the same thing, you know, not just have a community board that's sort of a, a window dressing, but really listen to people and say, what are your concerns? How can we be, make it? And, and, and it starts there. It doesn't start with, I've got the program for you. That's the wrong approach. Um, and, uh, and I think, and then, you know, like uh, hiring people who are 
you're going to be in positions of, uh, you know, like walking into my, the, the place where I practice medicine as a, as a resident and early career faculty, the only people of color present there were behind the front desk or, or custodians. That, that was initially the case. Now that changed over, over time. Uh, but I think that that's, uh, that helps create that, okay, you know, there's a difference here. Um, and I think the, it, you know, your Ken is entirely correct. You know, it, it has to start for real change to be implemented. You have to have leadership, uh, explicit commitment with resources behind it. So can, okay. can I make a one point? Oh, which is sure. like, I, I think you look for hubs, you know, the, the, the minister, you look for uh, uh, who's running training programs. You know, that's how STEM Boomerang is working because mm -hmm. I ran IMSD and I ran an NSF program and I was at NIH and I was, you know, so you, you, you use your connections that know the people and then that helps bring it to, together. The other thing that with Native students, so I started a program because we weren't seeing Native students coming up to the at junior level thinking about research. And so I started a program for freshmen and sophomores. I got the list of all the native kids that were applying to UNM. And we called all the ones that were interested in science and, and talked to them. And that's what it took for native students. Mm -hmm. was, that's right. And especially talking to their parents. Great point, yeah. All right. So uh, that, that, that point about personal outreach is mm -hmm. really critical. You know, I, I, I've heard stories, you know, of scientists who are trying to recruit in minority communities and they say, well, I don't feel comfortable. I'm not part of that community. And so they send their coordinator uh, and I go, no, 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 the scientists, the, the community wants to see you. They want to see the scientists. <laughs> uh, and, and, and that's one of the, that's a common thread that I think I've seen in the, uh, in the, you know, that, that it's not just the information or the web link. They, they want to see, okay, this person is really interested in us. Uh, and the recruiting of, of, uh, of my un underrepresented groups to, to uh, program, in my case, it was residency. I met stories where they said, well, your phone call to say that we really wanted you in this program really made a difference for me. I, you know, in terms of putting my nickel down and, and saying, I want to be at uh, UCSF residency or whatever. So thank you very much uh, for all the questions. Uh, but I really am afraid that we've uh, come to the end of our conversation here today. Um, and uh, on behalf of the UMass Boston Dana-Farber Harvard Cancer Center Partnership, we want to thank uh, our speakers of today, Elisel, Lindsay, Kenneth, uh, Lena, Maggie, uh, for this uh, informative and stimulating conversation. I also want to thank the audience for your participation. Uh, we look forward to continuing this conversation offline. Diversity in the scientific workforce is an important issue uh, that uh, will be with us for many years to come. And so uh, we look forward to potentially working together in the future. Have a great afternoon, everyone. And thank you very much for attending today's uh, webinar. Thank you thank so you. much, Adan and Vish. Thank, thank you, Adan. Thank you, Vish. Thank you, guys. It was a, it was a pleasure. A real pleasure.